Hello, my art history students. Welcome to, um, I guess, the middle of the semester. Typically, we would have had our midterm, and now we would be talking about uh, kind of the next phase, the second half of the course, the early Renaissance in Italy. Um, but since everything's different right now, we are not going to be having a midterm or a traditional midterm. Um, the, this week we're going to be learning about kind of the incredible cathedrals, Romanesque and Gothic, and I urge you to watch very carefully the video that I've assigned, the Nova video, that does this incredible comparison between um, the, two, the two kinds of structure, uh, Romanesque and Gothic, and dark and light, and all of the elements of what makes these incredible cathedrals. Um, and I also want you guys to pay attention to how many of the building techniques that we've been talking about since the beginning of the semester, post and lintel, corbeling, arches, uh, that are of course perfected by the Romans, how these are the, the basic building blocks that create um, these incredible cathedrals. So the key difference, of course, between a Romanesque, Roman-like uh, building and a Gothic is going to be whether the arch is rounded or pointed. The pointed arch is, of course, the Gothic, sort of the trademark Gothic um, element. So uh, I urge you guys to really pay close attention to the, the video and make sure that you answer the questions that I gave you. I, I urge you to write me in sort of more paragraph form. I don't need you to repeat the question back at me, but write thoughtful answers in order to get um, really the most out of the exercise. So we're going to be talking about the early Renaissance today. And um, I just want to sort of start with some of the Renaissance's main ideas. And I, I have a handout that if we were talking, if we were teaching in person, I would have handed out in class. But here it is. It's, it, it, I scanned it in. It's not so great. But these are sort of a, a few ideas that um, kind of found the, form the foundation of the Renaissance. Um, and they are that there are lots of economic changes going on. Uh, the Renaissance, typically, we give credit that it begins in Florence, which is a beautiful little a city, not a little city. It's a city in Italy. Um, the Black Plague, which was the considered, I believe, to be the bubonic plague, has killed many, many people. And in fact, there's no monarchy. And so these three things come together, and they are credited with the beginning of the Renaissance. So just things for you to think about. I also want you to look at this drawing that I've uh, scanned in for you. It's, it's pretty well known, and I hope that some of you have seen this before. It's Vitruvian Man by Leonardo da Vinci, the artist who not only painted the Mona Lisa, but was responsible for many incredible um, uh, engineering accomplishments and poetry and painting and sculpture and all these things that we're going to look at. But what's important about this image is that it gives you a visual uh, understanding of how now man is the center. Right? Man is the center of the world. It's no longer only about this God that people are afraid of, but they have man as the center of the world. And what does that mean? The word renaissance means rebirth, right? So, okay, what? It's rebirth of what? What, what are we talking about? What are, what's being reborn in the renaissance? And what's being reborn are the ideas of classicism. So the question is, how do you take classicism, which is really coming out of Greece and Rome, right? When we talk about classical art, we're talking about the art of Greece and Rome. And those are typically, they are pagan cultures. So how do you actually take classicism and yet combine it with Christianity. How do you do that? Well, during the Middle Ages and the Dark Ages, we saw that that wasn't possible at all. And so all the depictions of the human figure would have been thin and light and sort of weightless. Um, but now that's not going to be the case, right? Because the main idea behind the Renaissance is that 
Platonic or pagan ideas and Christian ideas are not necessarily at odds. They can actually go together, right? And that in understanding human experience or things that we call human or classical humanism can lead you to a greater understanding of God, right? It can it give you a spiritual calling. Why is that? Because if man is the measure of all things, then man is the measure of all things. And if God created man, then hey, we can study man. And, and, and when I say man, I mean man and woman. We can study the human body and the naked human body and everything that is in this world. If you believe that God created it all, then nothing should be sinful to explore and to understand. And that understanding all aspects of human experience is actually going to lead to better people. And so this is something that I really want you to understand um, is kind of shocking, right? It's kind of new um, compared to everything that was going on in the Middle Ages. So the Renaissance in Italy really begins in Florence. And I want to just kind of start with uh, the idea. Here you see our friend the Doriferos, who we learned about in, in ancient Greece. And the human body has always created, you know, quite the challenge for, um, for artists. And it, it still does today. And so we're going to be talking about the human body. What have we seen so far in relation to the human body and the human figure, right? I'm going to move over here so you can see. There we are. That's better. I'll put myself back. Well, in ancient Greece and Rome, artists embraced the realities of the human body and the way that our bodies move in space, which is very naturalistic. However, for the next thousand years after Constantine converts to Christianity, while Europe transitions from this pagan culture to a Christian one, they had to repress, they had to suppress everything about the physical body because it was believed that you couldn't be spiritual. You couldn't be thinking about the next world and the immateriality of religion if you were making things about the human body that was really realistic. And so in the medieval world, you saw that human figures were created on the exterior of many churches, but they were elongated, right? They were flattened. They were static. They were symbolic. And what's going to happen now in the Renaissance is we're going to go back to the way classical sculptors, Greek and Roman sculptors, represented the human figure, and it's not going to be believed to be contradictory. Okay? So here we go. We're going to start with um, this painting by Cimabue. It is of the Madonna enthroned with angels. Okay, and I want you guys to look at it really carefully. Okay, here you can see that um, the figure is super elongated, super flattened, and that she's functioning symbolically, right? But there's going to be this moment of transition now, and this is actually the comparison that I want you guys to do right here, right? So look at the date. 1280 to 1290, she's made of tempera, and tempera is a new medium, and there's a really cool video in your book about tempera. Basically, it's made from egg, that's the, the medium that holds the, the, the colors together. And so 1280 to 1290, right? And all of a sudden, you have this one by Giotto, which is only, you know, 20 or so years later. However, there's a huge difference between these two. There's a huge difference between these two. And by the way, Giotto was Chimabue's student. So I want you to look at these two for a minute. And I'm going to show you a really great video that's going to help you with your comparison. So this is um, a really wonderful video from Khan Academy comparing the two paintings that I want you to write about. Um, and I'm going to turn it on for you and I'm going to try to close the window that you see me in. So here we go. Let me make it a little bit smaller. 
So we were going to do a comparison of two great Proto-Renaissance masters, Cimabue and Giotto, and compare them by looking at two paintings of the Madonna and Throne, so exactly the same subject. These are both in the Uffizi in Florence, but originally, of course, there were altar paintings, panels, which are very large. In fact, the, the Cimabue is... Uh, More than 12 feet. Yeah, it's 12 feet tall. It's huge. And that was so that it could be seen the full distance of the church nave. And the Giotto, too, is more than 10 feet high. The Cimabue is a little earlier, and Cimabue is the very first artist that Vasari talks about at the very beginning of this incredible tradition of right. Italian painting. So Cimabue is really seen to make this first step away from a medieval style toward a more human-focused Renaissance style. Yeah, and there's a lot of controversy and interest in terms of why the Renaissance has its roots at this particular moment in this mm -hmm. particular place. I mean, why in Florence and why right here at the end okay. of the 13th century? And mm -hmm. one of the theories that's been put forward is pressure that was being felt in the Byzantine Empire to the east by Islam and some of the artists perhaps fleeing the great traditions of, of the east and coming to Italy and perhaps prompting it to think beyond uh, the traditions of the medieval. The first thing to say is that this is just a really standard subject that we see all the time. Mary, the mother of Christ, holding the Christ child surrounded by angels and or saints and prophets, lots and lots of gold. These are tempera paintings on wooden panels. It's egg tempera, and it's using minerals that are suspended in that egg media. It's, it's good for little lines. It doesn't blend mm -hmm. well. It, it dries quickly. And so there's a really linear aspect to this painting, which mm -hmm. may in some respects result yeah, from the tempera. tempera. This is gold that's been flattened out. It's right. a very pounded, thin, very thin. gold leaf, and in fact, mm -hmm. even tooled. That is to say, patterns have been pounded in to make it even more interesting. And then it's been glued onto the wooden panel. So it's been burnished, and sometimes there's a kind of clay layer underneath, mm -hmm. which you can sometimes see a little reddish. But the gold itself is really meant as this ornamental reflective material that had a symbolic quality and that right. it was meant to reflect the light of heaven. Neither of these are set in any kind of earthly realm. The flat gold background indicates a kind of divine heavenly space for these figures to occupy. And that makes sense when you look at the Cimabue because the Madonna, for instance, she's so, I guess maybe because she's defined by line, if she stood mm -hmm. up, you know, she would be so tall. She would be very elongated and her drapery is defined by line primarily and not as much by modeling from light to dark, although a little bit. There are some distinct medieval or Byzantine elements that are still visible mm -hmm. here. Her fingers are very long, her mouth is very small, the yeah. nose is very long. A kind of symbolism of the body, not a representation of a real person so much as a representation of a kind of ideal heavenly form. The angels are all stacked kind of on top it's of It's a good thing another. they have wings, isn't it? Yes. Because <laughs> what are they standing on? I don't know, but we do begin to get some sense of the beginnings of an illusion of space. A little bit. Chimabui. She's got a little modeling under her chin. Mm -hmm. And you're right, the, the throne on which she sits does sort of recede. Except here's the funny thing. When you look at the throne carefully, it looks as if we're looking across at the Virgin Mary, but we're looking down mm -hmm. at the seat on which she's seated. Yeah. And, and in some ways, we're also looking up at her. There's not a single perspectival point in which the viewer is situated. We have sort of multiple viewpoints. And that's something that, of course, will disappear more than a century later when we get to Brunelleschi in the early Renaissance. But I'm not comfortable with the idea that Cimabue couldn't do it. No. Yeah. So what about the four figures underneath? It's interesting that they're behind there. It does show some illusion of, it does. of it space. Does. And it kind of frames them as well. It does. And they're adorable down there, those prophets. <laughs> you can always tell the prophets because they're holding scrolls. Okay, so these are Old Testament prophets. Right. Who would have predicted the coming of a Messiah, okay. of a Christ. And here, in the Catholic tradition, of course, that would have been understood as Christ, as exactly. you said. Right. Let's look over now at the Giotto, because things have really changed. Madonna just looks so massive and bulky, and look at how her hips and her thighs cover her, that. And her knee projects forward. Throne, right? Yeah. Like her breasts and, are and her And look knees. at how differently the drapery is indicated. Instead of by uh, these the gold tiny lines, yeah. right, we now have real modeling from light to dark to indicate her knees That's and so her lap, and even how the drapery pulls across her chest and her breath. Okay. So, you guys, um, you can watch this. I think you should. It'll really help you with um, your comparison, but I just wanted to also help you with it and talk to you a little bit about it because this is one of the, the main assignments that you'll be doing for me um, right now at this point. There are several vocabulary words that you heard. One is chiaroscuro, C-H-I-A-R-O-S-C-U-R-O. It's in your book. 
chiaroscuro, which means light and dark. And also this idea, um, this word called modeling. Uh, here's the chiaroscuro, see, there it is. So light and dark helps to create a sense of modeling, right? What am I talking about? What, what do we mean by modeling? Modeling is a way to create a highlight and a cast shadow. And what it does is it gives something volume. It makes it feel very three-dimensional. And this is not something that we had really seen at all for the thousand years during the Middle Ages. So to go back to comparing these two figures, I wanted just to, to talk a little bit about it. So the one on the left, the Chimabue, as we learned and as I, I explained to you before, is a little bit earlier, right? She's, she's a little bit earlier over here. Um, and it was sort of the first step away from the medieval style. And it's sort of the first step towards the more human focused Renaissance style. Um, and, you know, the first thing to say is that this is just really a standard subject of uh, Mary, the mother of Christ, holding the Christ child, surrounded by angels and our saints and prophets and lots and lots of gold, right? This is something that uh, is very typical for this time. But what we're interested in is this inflection point that we're at right here, these, this comparison between the two. And if you will recall, I told you that it's, it's a very short time difference between these two. And in fact, And in fact, that this is what your assignment is, to sort of figure out um, the difference between the two and to, to do a good comparison. So I'm gonna leave you with this, with the, the comparison of these two. Um, and uh, I look forward to reading your responses about that. So you can use your book, you can use the, the Khan Academy video, and please uh, complete the, the assignment in that way. We're going to move on now to looking at some more of Giotto's works, and particularly we're going to look at this beautiful chapel that he paints for a wealthy patron, and it is called the Arena Chapel, or Cappella Scroveni, because the name of the patron who he does it for is Mr. Scroveni. One of the things that's so incredible about this is in fact, um, this one, and here's a beautiful sort of image of how it looks today. But one of the really beautiful things about it is this, this fresco that I wanna talk about, one of the panels, and you can see it, I believe it is, uh, here it is, you can see it on the wall, right? And if you see this and then you look at the dimensions, you see that it is itself almost about six six by six foot three. So they really are quite large, 